Okay, so uh, a little bird told me that if uh, that if you have uh, some number of people who register for a Zoom conference that you could expect about a quarter of them to actually show up. So we had about 150 people registered and we're at uh, 65 already. So we're, I guess we're doing pretty well. Uh, hopefully we'll, yeah, it's going, getting up to 70. Okay, so I guess I'll, I'll start because everybody's kind of Zoomed out. So we don't want to spend too much time with uh, formalities. It's very nice to see all these familiar faces and new faces and some people whose name I know, but I've never met. Uh, and uh, uh, really my, my, my uh, appeal to, to turn your cameras on was uh, mostly for me uh, to see, see all these, uh, all, the, all your faces. So uh, I'm Charles Rees. I'm a linguistics professor at Concordia and I'm also involved in the new Cognitive Science Center and Leah Popovich from our math department, uh, who's on my screen, she's in the upper left corner, and Rachel, who's also in the top row. Uh, Rachel Berger is the director of the uh, individualized programs, uh, it's, uh, interdisciplinary graduate programs that we have at Concordia, and she's also a history professor and involved in the uh, women's studies programs. And we had the idea of celebrating Ada Lovelace Day. Uh, Leah is going to talk for a few minutes and tell us a little bit about who uh, Ada Lovelace was and what Ada Lovelace Day is about. Uh, that's going to be very fairly brief. And after that, I'll come back and give another brief uh, talk about who David Barner is. And then uh, you'll get to hear from him himself. And then we'll have uh, some time for questions uh, that will be moderated by Rachel. And so uh, it's just nice to see lots of undergraduates here, uh, retired professors from Concordia and elsewhere, active professors, graduate students. Uh, I checked out some of your affiliations. There's people in robotics, mathematicians, there's linguists, psychologists, historians, philosophers, computer scientists, biomedical engineers. So it's a, a nice group we have, We're kind of perfect for representing the field of cognitive science. And at about, uh, one o'clock today, I noticed that we had uh, representatives from every continent here except Antarctica. So there's somebody from Ghana registered and people from Turkey and India and the Philippines and Germany and uh, Brazil. So I immediately started trying to send emails to research stations in Antarctica so we could have a real global celebration for uh, Ada Lovelace. But you know, if anybody's willing to lie to me and say that they're actually zooming in from Antarctica, just, just tell me a lie and I'll put it in the report to the Dean. Okay, so without further ado, I'm gonna turn uh, things over to Leah, who's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, Ada Lovelace. Are you ready, Leah? Thank you, Charles. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Charles, for the, uh, in, uh, for the opportunity to, to speak here. Um, it's a great pleasure to uh, give a quick introduction to who Ada Lovelace was, a person of great interest um, to the history of mathematics and the theory of computation, um, and especially to the role of women in those fields. Um, I'm going to give a quick introduction and put some, uh, a few pictures that I um, downloaded from a, a very um, uh, extensive description of um, untangling the tale of Ada Lovelace from Stephen Waltram's uh, website, where he has a blog on, on or a, a subset uh, uh, titled Writings. Um, so um, Ada Lovelace was a famous daughter of an infamous poet, Lord Byron, and a mathematically educated mother, Annabelle Milbanks. And she was privately tutored as most high society children um, and already at the age of 11, she showed a tremendous amount of imagination, um, uh, creating her own study of what she called flyology. She was trying to make designs that would uh, mimic the bird flight with steam powered engines. So here's one of those drawings, um, which was quite interesting for an 11 year old. In those days, uh, tutoring pretty much in mathematics, pretty much meant pursuing elementary geometry and algebra. And um, this is what she did, uh, especially during her bedridden teenage years. Because in those days, you, when you got ill, you really, <laughs> you, you could have been really unfortunate. Um, however, at the age of 17, um, she, she had a lucky chance to get a demonstration um, 
with uh, during a social visit with her mother to Charles Babbage's newly constructed difference engine. It was a ma massive thing, two feet high, 2,000 um, brass parts that can now be seen at the Science Museum in London. And um, this, was, this was a machine that he um, constructed or designed in, in order to, um, the, at the time there was a large concern in generating accurate numerical tables for um, industrial needs. And so he, he had this idea of constructing an automated machine that would use uh, mathematical results to reduce complex calculations for polynomials and other functions to basically sequences of additions and subtractions. So it was a, it was a fairly simple from, mod, from the modern point of view of, of calculation, it was a fairly simple idea, but from the point of view of executing this, with steam powered engines, it was, it was a non-trivial task. Um, Ada's mother already noticed, she sort of called it a thinking machine and noticed that, uh, that her daughter was quite enthused about um, the, the potential of this. And so she then, um, for, uh, the, it kind of inspired uh, a perseverance in learning higher mathematics. And so she um, managed through social connections to get a university level correspondence course with Augustus de Morgan, who was the first mathematics professor at the U University College London, also an author of several textbooks and quite influential as an educator. Um, and one can see through correspondence of Ada with, um, with both de Morgan and continued correspondence with Babbage that she, um, she, she really entertained a lot of interest in, in, in detailed readings um, of, of the new kind of level of mathematics that people were pursuing at the time that was inspired by Leibniz's ideas about calculus. Um, and that she, she, she was really interested in the sort of the rigor and the logic of, of mathematical constructions going to the extent that she even challenged some of the Morgan's claims um, and she was correct about it. Um, she was also, but what interested me most in, in reading about Ada Lovelace was the, the way she discussed, she, she had this great tenacity for learning and enjoyed the pursuit of abstract knowledge, but she also talked in very honest and humble ways about the difficulty of learning uh, mathematics and this process of sort of logical thinking and how you know one sort of progresses in in various levels and understands what one has not learned properly before. Um, and in the at the same time, she also um, in in these letters, which are which are available at the um, Oxford Library uh, at the I think it's the museum at Oxford. Um, she she also. You could see, even though she was exposed to different branches of mathematics, but she had all these imaginative and creative ideas still, despite this rigor in applying them to various real life models. So it was kind of a pervasive theme in, in, uh, in the way she thought about mathematics and always kind of trying to kind of connect the abstract thoughts to something the way it can be used or the way it can um, inspire some new, new um, uh, ideas or new machines. And uh, she was quite ambitious to hoping to do great things, but you know, unfortunately, her her health condition and and you know other realities of life did not uh, allow her to to go past the age of thirty six. But she did um, have one extremely famous paper, which was uh, written at the time when Charles Babbage was making signs for the analytical engine, which was kind of a, a level up from the difference engine because it really was meant to support a list of all possible different possible operations, not just calculations, additions, and subtraction. Um, he just created these designs that was never uh, uh, constructed, but um, she, uh, th there were notes taken when he gave lectures in Turin and these notes were in French. And so Ada actually translated these notes into English. And not only did she translate them, but she actually made quite a, a number of sub significant additions and comments of her own, uh, sort of explanations of how, how this, this can be executed, what the different kind of notation can be used, et cetera. 
And the most famous was the thing that I'm screen sharing right now is the Bernoulli numbers table, where essentially it's, it's what people would call one of the first algorithmic uh, modules that use, uses the sort of the stepwise process um, to, to explain how something can be um, achieved. Um, the, the, her, this paper was sort of, it went back and forth between her and Babbage about how it was going to be prefaced or not, you know, um, and she decided to sign it as AAL, um, her initials, and, you know, one can dispute why, one can discuss them why this was done um, from the point of view of whether it was because she was a woman or not and worried that it might not um, uh, be taken seriously. And it did not actually get a lot of uh, visibility at the time, but of course, in due time with people who are actually constructing machines, uh, uh, discussing the possibilities of the theory of computation like Turing, um, a lot of elements of her, of this famous paper were carefully read and, um, uh, uh, it, it, you know, even sort of there was there was a kind of a, a back and forth uh, discussion of whether she was, uh, you know, she she really put the limitations of computing in there or not. Um, and so I, I'm not going to say much more about it. Unfortunately, you know, as I said, she died young, and uh, this was probably the most famous thing that she she left behind. Um, I will just leave behind a few quotes that from this famous paper that show kind of how she thought about the connections of sort of the abstract notations or the abstract formalism of mathematics and um, sort of a pursuit of um, a pursuit of understanding the 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 nature for, uh, and the the different process around us and how this abstraction can contribute to both our insights or to to um, to further research into uh, the these truths of nature. So I will um, end my little introduction there, and I um, look forward to uh, Gardner's explanation of the cognitive side of things. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so just uh, so now we're uh, ready to move on to the main event. So I just want to. Uh, Say a little bit about our our guest who is graciously here, uh, well remotely here in this difficult time. So David Barner is a professor at uh, University of California uh, at San Diego, and he's got appointments in psychology and linguistics, and he's also a member of the Center for Research in Mathematics and Science Education. Uh, David studied psychology and speech pathology at McGill before going to Harvard for his PhD in psychology. But he's already always been uh, closely uh, allied and aligned with uh, people and ideas in linguistics, including uh, a lot of uh, very rich long-term collaboration with my colleague at Concordia, Alan Bale. And his, as we'll hear about today, his research uh, that's fairly broad, but it focuses on things like the development of math, language, and social cognition. Also, some work with rhesus monkeys. Uh, after a talk at Concordia about 16 years ago. Uh, he came over to my house and had my son and my dog crawling towards different sized piles of kibble to see who was better at math. I, I won't tell you about the outcome, but uh, uh, we'll, we'll see some videos that are related to this stuff, I guess. And uh, David supervises PhD students and postdocs in linguistics, psychology, philosophy, cognitive science, uh, including uh, he's taught a, a, a student from Concordia who actually is here in this meeting who studied with me and also with the people in math and math education. Uh, so I think some of them are here. You know who I'm talking about. Um, David was a Canada Research Chair at Toronto and he has lots of other honors, but I would guess uh, knowing him that he's most proud of the students he's worked with, many of them now in uh, tenure track positions or tenured positions. Uh, and so instead of going through all his honors, I'm just gonna focus on the two things that uh, that impressed me the most from his CV, uh, two of his consulting gigs. One is that he worked for the Jim Henson Company, which is, of course, the Muppets. And the other is uh, Max's Pirate Planet, a board game adventure, which promises parents that their kids will have a whale of a time. 
So I'm sure he can deliver the same to us in this talk. So now I'm going to turn it over to David. Thank you. <laughs> Thank, wow, thanks. Yeah, definitely. I agree that working with Jim Henson was the highlight of my, will probably end up being the highlight of my career. Uh, I got to go visit the Muppet land and see all the original Muppets and, uh, and Kermit the Frog and so on. It was amazing. Um, anyway, before I get started, I, I want to do a couple of things. Uh, first, obviously, thank um, Leah and Charles for introducing the event. Um, I also want to just quickly share a link to YouTube, which um, features the videos that I'm going to be showing today. Just in case you have any difficulty at all with the videos, you can queue them up and they kind of play in sequence with little gaps between them. So if you're, if you're experiencing any technical glitches, they're right there um, on YouTube. Um, also, uh, you know, I, I had a lot of fun. Charles prepared me for this um, and sent me all kinds of reading material. And I learned a lot in the process about uh, Ada Lovelace uh, and, you know, checked out her biography, which is fascinating. Um, and, you know, I just, in keeping with the event, I want to dedicate uh, this work to, uh, like Charles said, the people that I'm most proud of, uh, which is the graduate students that I've worked with, um, all of whom are amazing female scientists. Um, and some of whom are uh, present here. So that's actually a uh, really a big pleasure to see um, these you know, folks out there doing this work. And I also wanna uh, dedicate it to my daughter, Anouk, who will feature in the first couple of slides of this talk and who inspired the, the core intuitions of this talk about the distinction between mechanical procedures and rational insights in mathematics. So um, I guess for me, uh, learning about Lovelace was fascinating um, for a number of reasons. Uh, you know, obviously her mathematical abilities and her uh, difficult relationship to her philandering father, uh, Lord Byron. Um, but, you know, most interesting are her insights regarding the nature and potential of calculating machines. So uh, in her biography, it's noted that her mother, uh, Lady Byron, or the ex Lady Byron, uh, uh, after she left Lord Byron for um, some horrible reasons, um, well, she worried that her um, daughter might follow in her father's footsteps and become a, uh, a reckless poet and creator. Um, and so, you know, according to the biography, at least, this is part of the reason why she encouraged her to pursue mathematics. But the irony, of course, if you read further, is that her main contribution to mathematics um, and what she's remembered for was to notice the creative computational power of calculating machines and that they could be used, you know, not just to crunch numbers, um, but also to, you know, express content of many different types and that they had this potential as a computing device. So um, I should, I, I'm just gonna share my screen now with you um, before I go any further. Uh, all right, here we go. So, uh let's see here all right good um so everyone can see that i hope um so um okay so the thing that was especially interesting to me is you know in her comments on her friend uh charles babbage's analytical machine is that she recognized the role of um insight and understanding in mathematics and how this could be distinguished from uh, mechanical or procedural aspects of math. So um, in, in this uh, description, she says, you know, those labors which belong to the various branches of the mathematical sciences, um, although on first consideration, they seem to be the exclusive province of the intellect, might actually be divided into two distinct sections. One, the mechanical, because it's subjected to precise and invariable laws that are capable of being expressed by means of the operations of matter, um, while the other demanding the intervention of reasoning belongs more specially to the domain of the understanding. And so she says, um, once we admit this, well, we may propose to execute by means of machinery, the mechanical branch of these labors, reserving for pure intellect, that which depends on the reasoning faculties. Right. So what I find interesting in this text is that she wasn't merely concerned with the computational power of calculating devices, but Fundamentally, she's making a psychological claim regarding mathematical thought and whether we can make a clear distinction between the mechanical computations and the types of rational insight that allow us to do things that are essential to mathematics, like discover new algorithms, um, to notice analogies between different types of phenomena, um, 
to get insight um, or to invent new representational formats, for example. Um, so this distinction differentiates um, partly between implementation of mathematical formalisms um, from their creation and from the creation of axioms and first principles and new mathematical languages. Um, for example, like the uh, Cartesian link between uh, algebra and geometry, which once established affords a whole host of new computations and inferences that uh, weren't previously available, right? So this discourse really poses an interesting psychological question about how we can view the difference between mechanical and rational processes and raises the question of how each of these might originate in the mind. And that's the part that I really find fascinating. Um, what kinds of causal relationships might exist between mechanical computations on the one hand and moments of rational insight on the other hand. So as part of an answer to this question in this talk, I want to argue that the mechanical labors of the mind that, um, you know, that uh, Lovelace describes, particularly in the case of mathematics, allow humans to discover rational insights um, that otherwise wouldn't be available to them. And that our most profound mathematical discoveries hinge upon learning from and about the mechanical rules of thought. So to make this case, what I'd like to do is describe the ways that humans learn to implement mathematical procedures and how this is different from precursor representations um, that are perceptual in nature, for example, and then how these uh, mechanical algorithms fuel discoveries and insight, uh, such as the fact that numbers are infinite. So in particular, I wanna argue that drawing on the generative syntax of natural language, humans impose a system of rules onto memorized counting procedures to create recursive numerical systems. And this is really the beginning of these mathematical systems and how, give an example of how mechanical uh, or procedural rules can interact with insight. And then these mechanical com computations, when they're applied recursively to a finite set of elements, can not only generate a potentially infinite set of expressions, but they can also supply two other species specific products. Um, so one of these is the ability to imagine ideas and worlds that don't yet exist. So by just simply putting words together in novel ways, we can create ideas on the fly that generate all kinds of possible worlds. Um, and the other is the more general insight that the universe might extend beyond our finite experience of the world. Um, okay. So to make this a little bit more concrete, um, what I'd like to do is consider here two behaviors of my daughter, Anouk. Um, first at around the age of three, and then at around the age of nine. And so it's this distinction between these and some other things that she said around the house that really got me thinking about this. So here she is at the age of three. Oops. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. That's great. Can you count any higher? Eleven, twelve, thirteen, sixteen, seventeen, sixteen. Great. Thank you, Anouk. Okay, so there we see that she's got this finite, clearly memorized, limited procedure, right? And if I asked her at that age, um, Anouk, uh, what do you think? Do you think that uh, numbers can just keep on going forever? Or do you think that they have to stop at some point? And what you'd find at this age is that she'd say, no, numbers definitely stop. And she, she might say they stop at 100 or something. There's definitely a biggest number. Okay, so now here she is at the age of nine, which is about two years ago. Okay, so do numbers ever end or do they keep on going forever? They keep on going forever. We can only write so many numbers, but there are ways to go in like decimals and fractions. The fact that you can keep on adding something over and over and over again, that would have to mean that there's an infinite amount of numbers. Okay, so here in contrast, Anouk isn't just dealing with a finite set of numbers, but instead she seems to know that there's an infinite set of numbers, or she thinks that at least. And also her justification for this was, um, you know, really made me very happy um, because it's logical in nature, right? It's based on the application of a recursive rule that generates a successor for every possible number, um, uh, sort of an analog of what mathematicians sometimes call a successor function. 
So she notices that because you can keep on adding one, numbers have to go on forever. Right, so what I wanna do here today is argue that there's a special link between these two developmental stages, that the memorized procedures that Anouk begins with are ultimately the basis for creating the recursive rules that generate an infinite set of numbers. And despite the fact that she never directly experiences infinite number or space or time, she ultimately does infer that these things must go on forever. And what I'd like to argue is that it's on the basis of those formal mechanical systems um, that she uses to reason about them. Okay, so um, what I'd like to do next is just describe the elements that I think go into this uh, human mechanical path to number, the representations and procedures that are involved. Um, so first of all, um, in, in all the work that I'm gonna describe, I'm gonna describe how humans come to the task with a system of small number representations. Um, so they can associate uh, perception of small numbers with words, for example. And that this is just part of the architecture that they bring, but that this is very limited and doesn't get you very far. Um, but in addition to this, um, humans are capable of learning procedures and then learning algorithms that govern, the, govern those procedures. So for example, in the case of linguistic expressions like number words, um, we can learn uh, to concatenate decades like 20, 30, 40, 50, and so on with unit terms like one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And so what I'd like to argue uh, as part of this talk is that learning that rule that concatenates decade terms to unit labels is part of what allows children to make inferences, rational insights um, about number in general. Um, and in particular, the type of rational insight that I have in mind is the analogy between symbols on the one hand, like one, two, three, four, five, six, and cardinalities on the other hand. So children have to figure out that as you count up one word in the count list, you add one item uh, to a set and vice versa, that if you add one item to a set, you should count up one in the count list. And furthermore, they um, eventually have to figure out that that rule generalizes and that you can recursively apply this uh, function to get an infinite number of numbers. So what I'm gonna do is go about this in uh, three steps. So in the first part, I wanna tell you about a project that I started years ago and that's generated all kinds of really fun studies um, and some really amazing phenomena um, related to um, mental calculators. So what I'm gonna do is show you that there's this distinction between um, stored sets or um, small representations of sets and procedures that operate over them. Um, then I'm gonna make that same distinction uh, again, when I talk about number word learning in the second part of the talk and how two to five year old children learn how to count. Um, and then in the final part of the talk, I'll discuss how children use these learned counting procedures to derive uh, recursive procedures and then pull out rational insights uh, relating to the infinity of the numbers. Okay. So first let's start with um, mental calculators. Um, so this is uh, a really fun project that I conducted with a whole bunch of students um, in uh, starting in Toronto and then uh, eventually going over to India um, and working with uh, Mike Frank at Stanford and George Alvarez at Harvard University. Um, and we were initially really interested in, you know, this apparently special relationship between natural language and mathematics. And um, it was quickly pointed out to us that in uh, human history, um, you know, there's ev evidence going back at least 12,000 years of numerical symbols, um, but um, really obvious cases of calculators are present a couple of thousand years ago in the form of um, these abacus-like um, machines like the Babylonian uh, Salamis tablet or the Roman hand abacus, um, also the Chinese abacus, um, Russian abacus or shoti, and then finally the Japanese soroban. And what I wanna point out about each of these different computing devices is that they have these two properties. One is that they chunk beads in such a way that they're um, specially tailored to human cognition. So you'll notice that in the Japanese soroban, each of the columns of the abacus contains up to four um, items on the bottom. Those are called the earthly beads and one additional bead on top, which is called the heavenly bead. Now the beads on the bottom um, represent multiples of one or 10 or a hundred or a thousand, depending on which column you're in. And the beads on the top represent multiples of five or 50 or 500 and so on. So that if you squeeze beads together um, to the middle um, black bar, you can get sums of up to nine or uh, 
uh, 90 or 900 in each column, right? So it's a base 10 system. Um, but it accomplishes this by only requiring you to represent up to four beads at a time in the bottom, right? So it's taking advantage of these limitations of human cognition. And you see that going back all the way to the first abacuses, right? Like, so you see this in the abacus, the Roman abacus, in the Chinese abacus, and in the color chunking schema of the Russian abacus as well. But then imposed upon this structure are a set of uh, mechanical procedures, which in the case of the Soroban, as I'll show you in a moment, are defined in terms of motor processes. So these are not linguistic processes. They're actually um, uh, very routinized um, motor procedures. So to illustrate this, uh, I wanna show you two videos. One on the left of a child using a physical abacus. So he here is being shown uh, problems with 10 two digit numbers. So he's um, being asked to add and subtract in these problems. And um, on the left, he's using a physical abacus, which he's been using probably for about a year now. Okay. Now on the right hand side, this is mental abacus. Okay, so on the right hand side, now he's doing the same thing, but he's imagining the abacus in his mind's eye. And he's using the same motor procedures, operating over that imagined abacus to do the same calculations. So to do these calculations, he's moving his hands exactly as he would move them as if, if he were using the physical abacus. And in fact, if you slow down the video, we can correlate the number of movements of his hand with the number of operations that are required by that problem on the abacus. And so that's some work that we did with Susan Golden Meadow and Neon Brooks at the University of Chicago. Okay, so this mental abacus phenomenon is um, especially intriguing because it shows that the abacus, the design of the abacus allows it to be visualized in visual working memory. And then that interfaces with these motor procedures. Okay, so there's a whole lot of variability in, in how this is implemented. So you can see this child on the left has these very slow and meticulous movements, and you can very clearly see him moving the beads, right? And exactly which bead movements he's doing. Whereas this child on the right, um, unleashed um, and free of the physical abacus, um, goes incredibly quickly, which is quite typical of mental abacus users. Um, so this video isn't sped up. Um, it's you know, blurry in the original because she's moving so quickly. And in fact, this technique has allowed children 10, 11 years of age to win international uh, calculation competitions um, because it's so fast and also can be hacked in a variety of ways to compute, for example, square roots and other algorithms. Um, so what we see here, um, what I wanna show you is that not only is the abacus designed to keep in mind this limit of, for, of small numbers in each column, but also children are relatively limited to computing uh, any sum that, has, that implicates up to four columns. So if you extend problems um, up to five digit numbers, they get significantly more difficult to children, which suggests that each column is also being treated as some kind of object that's limited by visual working memory capacity. So if we give kids a problem like uh, 1356 plus 455, um, that's relatively easy to solve. It's not the easiest, um, but they can do it. But if you give them uh, uh, 13,560 plus uh, 4,550, they totally crash at that type of problem. And it's not the number of beads that are in play, it's the number of columns, okay? So in the figure on the left, you can see on the x-axis, the number of columns involved in each problem. And on the y-axis, the likelihood of a correct response and you can see that the likelihood of a correct response is directly related to the number of columns implicated. And in each of those clusters, you can see the number of beads that were um, involved in uh, computing that problem. And that's completely unrelated to success. Okay, so there's this really hard limit in numerical cognition on representing uh, small sets exactly. Beyond three or four uh, representations get noisy and too noisy for something like a mental abacus. Okay. Here's one final demonstration, which is especially remarkable. So in this video that I'm gonna show you, this is a child in Vadodara, India, um, again, 
who has been trained to use mental abacus. And for the first time, this, this is um, not something they practice, we asked her to listen to a story and then to repeat the words as she heard them. So she was doing a verbal shadowing task, um, in particular, um, Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. Okay, so, and we let the child choose whichever language they liked. Some chose Hindi, Gujarati, some chose English. She chose English. Um, so what she's gonna see is problems presented on the screen. You're gonna see them too, so you can play along at home. And if she got a problem right, then there would, um, an additional add-end would be added up to eight two-digit add-ends. Um, and the problems I'm gonna show you are an approximation because the screen is fuzzy, okay? So she's got 10 seconds per problem while uh, reading this story. The direction of the which they had come. Ali Baba watched all this in utter amazement. As the horseback rode past the tree, Ali Baba counted them. Lady Luck has by the collars. We are rich. Ali Baba then narrated the whole narrative to her. Okay. So uh, as you can see, this is incredibly impressive. Um, and it turns out, um, so if we do the same thing with UCSD undergraduates, um, this is the data from undergraduates at UCSD around the same time. So if we give them um, this task, we see that they can do up to about three two-digit add-ends um, with no interference. That's depicted in black, okay? Um, so two or three add-ends and they're okay. Um, and, but if we give them uh, verbal interference, we ask them to do that same task, then they can do about two add-ends um, before they crash out. So this is very, very difficult. Um, we also have a condition where we only ask um, the kids to tap their fingers um, or the adults in this case. And in the case of US adults, this has absolutely no impact on their performance. Okay, so whereas verbal interference uh, has a significant impact. Um, however, if we look um, back to the kids in India, so they're first of all, significantly younger, um, but also um, you, you can see that they just perform uh, massively better. So first of all, in the no, con uh, no interference condition, they can do eight uh, two digit add-ends um, about 80% of the time. And the second thing that's remarkable is that although verbal interference interferes with them, they can still do that same number of add-ends about 50% of the time and their performance with verbal interference is better than with motor interference, which means that if they're simply tapping their fingers, that's interfering with their performance more than if they're reading a story out loud, which is really, really remar remarkable and speaks to the format of representation, that these are really motor procedures that are interfacing with, um, with visual uh, representations. Okay, so, um, oops, so, um, what I'd like to do um, next is argue that this same uh, uh, division of labor can be found elsewhere in numerical cognition. And it's really characteristic of numerical cognition in a number of case studies. Um, so I'm gonna focus in the next part of this talk on number word learning. And I'm gonna show you that the exact same thing plays out here too, okay? So to do that, I'm gonna um, walk across the street to my neighbor, Lorenzo, who in this video is about two and a half years of age. And I'm just going to ask him to give me different numbers of things. Okay, what's sometimes called the given number task. Could you give me one block and put one block into my hand? Can you give me one block? All right. Thank you, Lorenzo. Okay, now I have another question. Can you find two blocks and put two blocks into my hand? You find two blocks. Wow, good job, Lorenzo. All right, here's another question for you. Can you find three blocks and put three blocks in my hand? All right, is that three blocks, Lorenzo? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah? Do you know how to count those and make sure? Can you count? One, two, three. Is that three? Yeah. All right, good job. Okay, so a um, couple of things to notice here about Lorenzo. So obviously when I ask Lorenzo for one, he seems to be able to give me one systematically, right? Um, so he seems to know the meaning of the word one. But when I ask him for two, he does give me two, um, uh, like we might expect if he knew the, the meaning of the word, but he gives me two for everything it looks like, right? So we can't really know here yet if, if uh, Lorenzo knows the meaning of the word two yet. 
The third thing that I want to notice, though, is that he has no idea how counting works. So if we were to ask Lorenzo to count as high as he could, this kid could count to five or maybe 10. So he knows these words. He knows how to recite them. He knows the pointing game. But he doesn't understand that that's related to answering this question of how many there are or how to use the procedure to get that answer, right? So he's really got these two systems. He's got this finite system that looks like it's maybe bounded at one or two. And then he's got this counting procedure on the other hand that he doesn't really know what to do with at this age, right? And actually it turns out that this is highly characteristic of children all over the globe. No matter what language you're learning, as long as you're exposed to a counting system, you're gonna show this division of labor. Um, and so beginning with work by uh, Karen Wynn in the 1990s, people started using this task to organize kids' behaviors into these different stages. Um, so initially kids around 24 uh, months of age in the US uh, don't know the meanings of any number of words, but they can count to like five or 10. Um, so if you ask them to give you two or one or whatever, they'll just give you a random uh, handful. But then or, you know, around the age of 26, 27, depends cross-culturally uh, quite a bit um, and between individuals, kids will learn the meaning of the word one. And so if you ask them for one, they'll give you exactly one thing and they won't give one for larger numbers at some point. Okay, so these kids are called one knowers. Uh, then uh, according to WINS data, you have to wait another six months up to nine months before kids learn the meaning of the word two. So this is very slow and protracted um, and it's slower among some kids than others. Okay, so these kids can give one and two, but not higher numbers. And then they learn after another sequence of months, the meaning of the word three. Okay, so on it goes. And some kids seem to become four knowers as well. But what you don't find is say eight knowers, right? Kids who can only give up to eight, but no higher number. Instead, there's this kind of um, phase transition where they figure out, there's almost like a moment of insight of, of sorts where they figure out that you can, that counting procedure that they were using all along in a blind way can be used to answer this question. So by simply pointing at objects and reciting the number of words in sequence and then giving all the objects that are implicated in that count, they can get the right answer, okay? And so these kids are called different things. Sometimes we call them full counters. Sometimes they're called counting principle knowers off after work by Rochelle Gelman in the 80s or cardinal principle knowers. I'm gonna call them full counters for the rest of this talk to make life easy, but my figures will use this acronym CP knowers because that's what people in the field uh, use. So again, there's this finite system of up to three or four, and then there's this completely separate system, I wanna argue, of counting procedures. And initially, this is totally blind and only gradually gets content as children uh, gain experience using it in very specific ways. So what's really remarkable um, is that if you survey natural languages and you look at the morphosyntactic uh, number systems across languages, you find this finite this fi this kind of finite system over and over again. Even in languages that don't have counting systems per se, you find languages that have a singular plural distinction. So some kind of morpheme for singleton sets or sets of one. You find languages with sing singular dual plural, singular dual trio plural and maybe even up to four, but that's disputable, okay? So there are languages with no number of words, some with only one, some with only two or three, right? And in fact, this is such a, a prominent idea that um, you find it in um, popular fiction, like uh, this uh, story by Richard Adams that I really love and read to my daughter Anouk, Watership Down, um, where you know Adams uh, describes the counting system of rabbits and says that rabbits can count up to four, but beyond that, they just say a lot, right? So that's prayer, um, also the name of the enemies like foxes and so on. So there's this clear pattern um, and, and you also see that there's this distinction is made very categorically in some languages. So um, work by patients apps on um, hybrid systems like the Natahup languages um, in Brazil, Colombia and Venezuela show that various different dialects have a one, two, three system. Okay, so al almost all of them do. Um, and so, for example, da has a word for one, which is unity, and then two is eye quantity, right? Um, and then three is rubber tree seed quantity. And some of the dialects max out at three. They don't have anything else. But some of the dialects also have a gesture system, right? So you can, for example, raise one hand like this and say has no sibling because it's an odd number, or you can raise two hands and say has a sibling because it's an even number. 
and you can concatenate these labels, right? So for example, if I want to say five, I can say uh, one hand exists, or I can say two hands exist, or I can say uh, two hands, one foot exist, right? If I want to express 15. Um, and there, some, of the, some of the speakers of these dialects can concatenate freely to describe ever larger numbers. So they're clearly using this gesture system, this externalized system of tallying, and then labeling the different states of those gestures, using those labels um, to morphologically compose them to describe ever larger numbers. So this is what Epps describes as the origin of numeral systems across these different dialects, and really um, worth reading if you haven't checked out this work before. So what I want to assert is that these are really the same thing. When children are learning one, two, and three, that's the same thing as what the um, Natahup are doing when they learn one, two, and three, or when they create these different um, small number systems. And that likewise, when children learn to count, they're doing something categorically different, just as we see in the Natahup. Um, so these are these small number systems, I want to argue, are really separate from what's going on with counting and tallying, body counting systems, calculators, and so on, these procedural systems. Um, so one way of showing this is to show that these systems causally interact and that they have the same content. So when you're learning both of these systems at once, the prediction is that they should affect each other. And so there's a bunch of work now showing um, or suggesting that this is true. Um, so if you think about it, uh, if you're a speaker of English, a singular plural language, when you hear the word one, and let's say that you don't know what one means, if you hear it in a singular expression like there is one cat, you can infer that one denotes a singleton set just on the basis of it being used in a singleton expression like there is cat, right? Whereas if you hear there are two cats now being used in the plural, you can infer that there's some contrast there that maybe two denotes sets that are greater than uh, one. And so people have reasoned this way and suggested that therefore English speaking kids should learn the meaning of one earlier than children who are acquiring Japanese and Mandarin um, since one and the singular share some kind of semantic core. They're, in some way, kids are learning the same or solving the same problem. And that's been shown in a number of studies now. Uh, Mathieu Lecoq has a study that shows this um, in Mandarin. Barbara Soneka compared Russian and English to Japanese. And I have also some Japanese data um, and so this is, you know, suggestive, but it's also potentially problematic because um, one thing that you notice if you do a lot of this work cross-culturally is that U.S. parents are kind of strange in their relationship to early education. Um, so especially high SES um, parents um, really train their children heavily on counting. And so, and I'll show you data like this in a moment. Um, whereas if you go to, for example, Europe, different parts of Europe, um, kids often can't count past 10 by the time they enter preschool. And that's also true in um, parts of Asia, okay? So it may just be that US parents are just training their kids more and that's why they get started earlier. Um, but you notice in all these data sets that the Japanese and um, Chinese kids um, pass English speaking kids almost immediately. So they get started earlier, but they um, are quickly surpassed. So what we wanted to do is uh, get slightly stronger evidence of this nature by looking at languages that have that additional dual morpheme Right? So they have a singular plural distinction, but they also have a dual. Um, so the dual is found in a lot of different languages. It's um, present in uh, different ways in Hebrew and Slovenian, Arabic, Latin, Sanskrit, uh, and in other languages as well. Um, and so what we wondered is whether hearing the word two used in dual morphology might accelerate learning of it, which would be compatible with the idea that these are really um, you know, two versions of the same system that the early number word system is like a morphological paradigm that kids are learning. So we studied central Slovenian, which is spoken in Ljubljana. Um, and in this dialect, um, if you, for example, say one red button is lying on the table, the singular is marked on the word one, on the word red, on the word button, and on the word lying. But if you say two red buttons are lying on the table, the dual, um, and for that matter, the plural, um, is marked on two red buttons and then lying as well. So it's very, very robustly marked throughout the sentence. So the idea is that if the child already comprehends the dual um, that's present in the language, dual morphology, then they should be able to use that information to make guesses about what the meaning of the word two is, right? And therefore they should um, learn the meanings of one and two faster than English speaking kids. 
So let me show you some data from English first, just for context and to let you get familiar with this uh, figure. So this is that task, the given number task, where we ask kids to give us um, one, two, three, and so on, and find the highest number that they comprehend, or if they're full counters. And what you can see is that in this group of um, two to five-year-olds, the youngest kids, the 24 to 29-month-olds, are all non-knowers. So they don't know any numbers, although they can count, right? And I'll show you that in a moment. Um, so they can recite the count list, they just don't know what it means. And then if you go to the end of this age range, 54 to 60 months, you'll see that almost, well, in fact, all the kids are full counters, right? So in between, you see that there are some one knowers. In blue, there are some two knowers, some three knowers, and four knowers. Um, but at the, there's a full transition here that takes place. And this is really in contrast to what happens in central Slovenian. So first thing that really pops out, I mean, um, partly because I just highlighted it in blue, um, is that there's a lot of two knowers, right? In fact, um, about 50% of kids at almost every age are two knowers in Central Slovenian. And there are more two knowers um, in this group than in any other group that um, anyone has ever tested um, in different languages around the world. So that pops out and is interesting. The second thing is that if you look at the very youngest age range, right, the 24 to 29 month olds, you'll see that almost none of the kids are non-knowers. So about 75% uh, of the kids know at least one. Okay, so they seem to be faster to get started. But then if you look at the uh, end of the age range, only about half of the kids are full counters. So these kids are getting started earlier, but they're taking longer to become full counters. And so at first this seems really puzzling. What on earth is going on? Um, well, what we think is going on is that learning the singular and the dual is selectively beneficial for learning one and two, right? Because those share content, they're the same system. Um, but that doesn't help you at all figure out how counting works because counting is a totally separate system that is dictated by your exposure to the counting algorithm, those procedures. Um, so uh, I'll, and let me show you evidence for that. But before I do, I just wanna um, note that this same advantage replicates in uh, Arabic. Um, so um, in a similar study done in Saudi Arabia by colleagues at UCL, um, which we uh, put together, they found the same advantage that was related to knowing the dual. Um, and also this pattern isn't true if you learn a non-dual dialect of Slovenian. Okay, so it turns out that in <laughs> Slovenia, I learned uh, deep into this project, not everybody learns a dual. Um, so if you look at the north, um, where the, there are these black dots, these are dialects of Slovenian that feature um, uh, dual morphology. But in the south, um, these dialects don't have a dual, okay? But otherwise are the same language. They're mutually comprehensible um, languages, right, dialects. Um, and so what we did is we tested kids in Ljubljana, in central Slovenia, where there's a dual, and in Slovenska Bistrica, where there's a dual, and compared them to kids in Novogorica and Metlika, and found that this advantage was only present among kids who acquire the dual. Okay, and the, the neat thing is that this is related to independent tests of whether they comprehend dual morphology, but not to counting knowledge. So if you just ask kids to count as high as you can, right, um, as, as I did a nook at the beginning of this talk, um, what you find is that all of the dialects of Slovenian, the kids in all of those dialects can count up to about 10 by the time they're five, okay? Whereas if you look at the black bar, the top bar, those are US kids in San Diego, they can count to about 50 by the time that they're five. So the uh, different dialects of Slovenian uh, have different, uh, obviously some are learning dual, some are not, but their counting behaviors don't change. These, this highest count predicts when you become a full counter but it doesn't predict when you learn one and two in these data sets. So these are, again, totally separate learning uh, pr uh, procedures. So uh, one more piece of evidence for this distinction between small numbers and counting procedures comes from bilingual children learning Spanish and English or French and English. Um, so we're interested in this project for a number of reasons. We are, um, for one thing, just interested in whether learning how to count once would help you the second time around, right? So if you learn in Spanish, does that help you in English? Um, is there conceptual transfer? So is the problem of learning to count hard because you just don't have the concepts, you don't know what two is or something. And so learning in one language um, 
provides that conceptual content that you can just subsequently label more easily. So to get at this, uh, we tested kids who were either uh, Spanish English bilinguals or French English bilinguals with, for a total of 146 kids. And we gave them that uh, give a number of tasks. We asked them to give us one, two, three, four, um, et cetera, uh, objects. And we also asked them to count as high as they could. Okay. And the reason we did that is so that we could identify which language they got the most training in. And we called that their NL1 um, or their uh, kind of dominant number language. And this just helps us organize the data and, and interpret it. Okay, so I'll show you here. And by the way, just um, for reference, most of the time the NL1 in these kids, like 90% of the time that's English, all right? So on the x-axis, I'm showing you the NL1 knower level. So the child's dominant number language knower level. So you can see that uh, 10 of these kids were non-knowers in their NL1, 15 were one knowers, 20 were two, new up to two, 16 uh, new up to three, uh, nine new up to four. And then there were 77 kids who were full counters. So you give them any set up to 10 and they can count them and give you the correct number. So now the question is, is there transfer? Does this confer an advantage on their second language? So represent this, I'm gonna show you um, this black bar. So black is the percentage of kids who match. So if you're a non-knower in your NL1, you're also a non-knower in your NL2, right? And so you can see that in the case of non-knowers, if you don't know something in one language, pretty likely you don't know something in the other language too. But that's not transfer because you can't transfer a lack of knowledge. So not knowing anything doesn't help you not know something in the other language, right? <laughs> doesn't confer any advantage. But uh, does learning one help you learn one in the second language? Like un or uno? It, it, it does not. Um, so actually uh, the likelihood of, your, uh, of having a match between your two languages is about 30% for one knowers, for two knowers, for three knowers, and for four knowers. So in other words, you have these kids who know uh, in French, for example, um, but don't know um, one in English, or who might know two um, in English, but not deux in French, which is really weird because they can count higher than that in both of the languages. So it's not like they don't know the numbers, right? They know all of the words, but they don't know that they're the same word. Just like you might know what cat is in English, but not know what it is in French. Okay, so they, it's just a, a question of associative learning, of figuring out which labels go with which sets, and they're totally separate problems in these two languages. However, it's not true for counting. So if we look at the county, uh, full counters, if you're a full counter in one language, very, very likely that you're a full counter in your second language too, okay? So which suggests that there's, these are really separate learning problems. On the one hand, there's this associative problem of, of matching these small sets to, to labels, and on the other hand, there's this problem of learning these counting procedures and those procedures transfer across languages. Um, so one, two, and three do transfer and counting doesn't transfer. But then the question is, well, what do children actually know about counting at this stage? Do they have a fully recursive system that generates an infinite number of numbers? Um, we know it's not just a memorized routine because they can give sets, but do they really understand how counting works at this point? And the answer to that is they definitely do not. Um, they definitely don't get it. And to show that, I wanna go back to poor uh, Lorenzo um, at, uh, across the street. So just to remind you, uh, at the beginning, I mentioned that Anouk started with this kind of memorized finite procedure. And eventually she gets to these rational insights, right? That as you count up one, you add one and vice versa. And this gets you an infinity of numbers. Well. Lorenzo definitely doesn't know this. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show him a set of things. Um, we're gonna put six things into a container and then we're gonna add one and just ask how many. And what you should notice here is that Lorenzo is a very good counter, okay? Uh, he's not, it's not like he doesn't know how to count at three and a half. He's a very good counter. He just doesn't know how counting works at all. He doesn't understand it. All right, are you ready, Lorenzo? Yeah. Okay. Can you do me a favor and can you find six pennies? And can you put six pennies into that cup? I can count them. All right, you can count. One, two, three, four, five, six. Awesome job. So how many pennies are there in there now? Six. Six pennies. All right, now watch what I'm gonna do. All right, I'm gonna put one penny in here. How many pennies are there in there now? One, two, three, four, 
Okay, do you remember what I did? How many pennies did you put in there at, uh, at the beginning? Six. All right, now I'm gonna put one more in, watch. Okay, now how many are there? Are there seven or eight? Eight. Right, so Lorenzo knows how to count, but he doesn't know, he doesn't have this, this mapping between counting and cardinality. So he doesn't know that if you add one to a set, you count up one in the count list, right? That basic structure mapping. So he's got the procedure, but he hasn't learned all of its properties yet. And he hasn't figured out the logic that governs why it works. And it turns out that this is a very general phenomenon. If you look at large groups of kids, you see this over and over and over again. Um, so this is the task that I just showed you. Okay, I'm gonna put four frogs in here and then I'm gonna add one more. Now is it five or six? So this was used by uh, Sarneka and Carrie originally. Um, and I'm gonna show you some data from our lab uh, from Kate Davidson, uh, who's now at Harvard. And what she found, uh, so she just divided kids up according to how high they could count, but these are all full counters. These are kids who can accurately give sets up to 10, no problem, okay? So first I'm gonna show you kids who can only count up to 10 or 19. So what we called low counters. So when you ask them count as high as you can, they get stuck at like 12, 13, 14, et cetera. So when we put four frogs into the um, bucket and add one, and then say, now is that five or six, almost all of these kids totally guess. Okay, so these are very small numbers and they don't know that just adding one means that you should count up one. Um, if you look at kids who can count up to 29, what you see is even for those very small numbers, four and five, so the white bar again, okay, there's still um, a lot of these kids are still guessing randomly. Um, when you give them a forced choice, a two alternative forced choice, um, they guess randomly. And if you test those same kids on medium sized numbers in the teens, they're even worse. And this continues upwards actually. And in fact, it's not until about five and a half years of age, which is two years after kids become full counters that they're able to do this in a general way that they're able to say that for any number, 55, if you add one, you've got 56. Or if you add one to 24, you've got 25, et cetera. But they can tell you what number comes up next. So if you say to um, a kid at this age, what comes after 24? They can tell you that it's 25, right? They just don't know how that relates to cardinality, that adding one to the set justifies going up one in the count list. So as I just mentioned, um, work by Purina Chung, uh, um, Singapore National University, a former student of mine, actually uh, was an undergrad at University of Toronto. Um, she did a study where she found that this doesn't resolve itself and become fully general until kids are five and a half. And interestingly, it's about six months after this, um, we estimate that kids think that numbers are infinite. So there's some kind of progression where first kids figure out a generalized rule that you can, you know, this successor function, right? That you can, as you count up, you should add one and that you can do that recursively. Um, it's sometime after that, that they, that they derive this insight that therefore numbers must never end because you can always add one like a nook noticed at the beginning of the talk. So Purina's hypothesis was that this is related to counting experience. Um, and that counting is related to infinity, in particular because kids notice the recursive syntactic rules of natural language that generate this potential infinity of numbers. So what do I mean by this? Um, this is where I want to draw on the uh, morphology and syntax of language as a possible source of insight about the infinity of numbers. So um, if you look at Cantonese, this is uh, Cantonese numbers up to 39, you'll notice something um, really interesting that others have noticed before, which is that the numbers one through nine are irregular. Okay, so you have to memorize those. Um, but if you know the word for 10, which is sap, then you can just concatenate 10 and each of the words for one through nine to get 11 through 19, right? So 10, one, 10, two, 10, three, 10, four, 10, and so on. Much easier than in English, where we have this bizarre system of saying like seven ten, but then we get when we get to the twenties we say you know uh, two four um, for example. So this is very highly regular. To get to say twenty, it's two ten, and then two ten one, two ten two, etc. And thirties are the same. So there's really this very clear um, and available representation of the morphology of counting 
which means that it should be easy to get the rule and to figure out that you can recursively create ever greater numbers, right? And so it might be this that leads children to infer that numbers never end because there's a rule for generating ever higher numbers. Now contrast that with a language like Hindi. Um, so again, you have irregular or memorized words up through nine, right? Same as in Cantonese. Um, and then you have a word for 10, which is here das. But what's weird is that 11 isn't just 10 plus one, right? So actually the one here is this word, gya. Um, that's unrelated to this word, one. And then 10 is nowhere to be seen in 11. And actually 12 doesn't contain two. Um, and you know, th uh, 13 doesn't contain three and so on. So there's tons of irregularity here. And there is a morpheme for 10, it's ra, but it's also not consistent. So you see that some words have ra, some have da, some have a. And that type of irregular, irregularity continues upward all the way to 100. So for each decade, there's irregularity in the one through nine, right? So you can see that these are all different. If you look across um, the fives, panch, pond, pak, uh, pen, right? They're all different. And also the labels for the decades are different and variable um, for each decade. So this is a hugely difficult problem. And it turns out that um, when we hired Hindi and Gujarati undergraduates to work on this, um, uh, on this project, they couldn't count in their native languages. We had to teach them. And it took the whole summer to teach them how to count up to 100 so that they could administer the tasks. Although all of them could count in English, no problem. It was very difficult. Um, so what we were wondering is whether this difference in linguistic transparency affects how readily children learn this recursive rule or this, this plus one rule. Um, and so to do this, we did this um, large scale uh, study across four different sites uh, led by Rose Schneider, a graduate student in my lab um, and a team of undergraduates, in, including Sneha Patel, who's uh, featured here with a group of kids that we tested. Um, and so we um, went to Hong Kong, uh, Slovenia, and, and we uh, tested kids in the US as well, where the uh, counting systems are all relatively transparent. There are some irregularities in the teens, like I mentioned, but um, all in all, these are highly regular relative to Hindi and Gujarati, which we tested in Vadodara, India, in uh, kind of Western India. Um, also in India, we tested children who were learning to count in English at an English medium school. Um, okay, so um, we got at this question in a couple of ways. So here's the simplest way, I guess, to get at this, um, although it may not be super simple to explain. We'll see how I can do. So one way of getting at this is just to ask kids to count as high as they can. Okay, so if you ask, uh, it turns out a variety of people have never shown this. If you ask a kid who's say uh, three and a half or four to count as high as they can, the most likely place they'll stop is 19, 29, 39, 49, okay? So why might that be? Well, if you just memorized uh, a, a frozen list that had no rules, what you'd expect is that they would stop randomly at different points, right? Um, they'd stop at 17 or 22, right? But why stop at 19, 29, 39? Well, that indicates that they're using that rule. They're using the decade plus unit rule. And what they're missing is the arbitrary labels for each of the decades, the words 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, and so on. And so that's exactly what you see in um, Cantonese, Slovenian, and English. And so what you would predict then is if I gave you a little bitty nudge, so I just told you the label for 30 or 40, that you'd be able to now continue by applying that rule up to the next decade until you get stuck again. And so on the x-axis here is the child's initial highest count. So where they get to before they make their first error. And then on the, on the y-axis is um, their final highest count. So these kids in light blue, those are the kids where their initial count and their final count is the same word. So they count up to 25 and we say, oh, the next number is 26. We give them this little boost and they say, well, that's interesting, but I have no idea what to do next, right? So they have a memorized finite list. Um, but there are these other kids where they get up to 29 and we say, oh, by the way, the next word is 30. And they're like, oh, right. Okay, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. And they go all the way up to the next decade. And then we tell them, oh yeah, the next number is 40 and they keep going. So these are kids, the blue dots, who can go up at least 20 numbers beyond their initial highest count. 
So we call these blue dot kids productive counters because they seem to know a rule for concatenating the units in the decades. Um, and the light blue kids, non-productive kids, because they seem to have just memorized up to their initial highest count. They don't know anything else. They don't have that rule. And so what you can see is that in Cantonese and in Slovenian and in English, there are some kids who are finite, right? They have a, a relatively low highest count up to 30, right? You can see. Um, but then there are these kids, a large group of kids in each language who can keep on counting um, um, to much higher numbers when prompted. Okay. But if you look at Hindi and Gujarati on the bottom left-hand corner, you'll see that almost all of the kids have a finite count list and that prompting them, giving them next number does them no good at all, right? They haven't pulled out rules for um, predicting the next number. And that's not just because these kids are from India, because if you look at uh, Indian kids learning English, they're also productive counters, right? So they also pull out rules. Um, and what's interesting about this is that this is predictive of how they do on this task that Lorenzo did. So we add five items to uh, a pond, okay? And then we add one more and we ask, is that six or seven? And what we find is that children learning these relatively uh, transparent languages are perform significantly better than kids who are learning these much more opaque languages um, on that same task. So suggesting that there's this benefit for learning a transparent language that allows you to pull out that successor function rule, this um, isomorphism between counting up one in the count list and adding one item to the set. Okay. Now, although our original plan was to go back to India and ask how this is related to intuitions about in, uh, infinity, and we started to do that work in the US, um, we, so we, that was interrupted by the pandemic. We do have some data from uh, kids in the US that was collected by Junyi Chu, uh, who was a lab coordinator in my lab and, and now a graduate student at MIT. So what she did is she asked kids to count as high as they could, and then she classified them as non-productive counters on the left and productive counters on the right. And then she gave them an infinity interview. So she just asked these kids, do numbers ever end? And is it always, is it possible to add one to any number or do you, is, is there a certain point where you can no longer add one? Um, so those are the two main questions asked in this interview that was originally used by Rochelle Gelman. And what she found is that if you are a non-productive counter, so if you have a finite count list, you also are likely to think that numbers never end. Right? So right up to around the age of five, five and a half, kids think that numbers are finite and it's related to whether or not they have this rule. Whereas kids who are productive counters and who can keep on counting 20 numbers past their initial highest count, um, about 40% of those kids think that numbers are infinite, which is compatible with Pur Purina Chung's claim that the first step to figuring out that numbers are infinite is getting this recursive rule and then noticing its entailments, noticing that if there is such a rule, then it must be the case, as Anouk pointed out, that numbers never end. All right. Um, so what I've talked about here um, in, across these different sections of the talk is first um, the, uh, the existence of these stored finite representations, right? That are expressed in the abacus, um, that are kind of the workspace for, do, for implementing procedures of arithmetic um, that you find in number word learning, that you find in morphological systems as well. Um, but also these recursive procedures that we see, for example, in natural language, um, this kind of um, list that can be generated through rules that then allow for different types of rational insights, such as figuring out that numbers can be placed into correspondence with sets, um, uh, the structure mapping, and that that rule that uh, relates these two systems um, is recursive or can be applied infinitely to generate uh, an infinite number of numbers. Um, so I want to kind of um, end by relating this to uh, the way that uh, Lovelace sets this up in the beginning, right? So uh, just to recall, she says, um, as I quoted her at the beginning, that we may propose to execute by means of machinery, the mechanical branch of these labors reserving for pure intellect, that which depends on the reasoning faculties. So what I've um, tried to argue here is that the creation of these mechanical operations, in fact, lays a foundation for rational insight. So there's a causal relationship between these. Um, this creates a foundation for insight, not only into the nature of numbers, including relations between them and their logical entailments, um, 
but might also extend to reasoning about things that numbers can be applied to, such as space, time, and other dimensions of experience that we use um, that we just we use mathematics to describe. Okay, uh, to end, I, I just want to again thank everyone, um, and I want to um, thank the graduate students who worked on these projects: uh, Jessica Sullivan, uh, Purina Chung, Rose Schneider, Junyi Chu, and also a shout out to my daughter uh, Anouk. Uh, thank you, everyone. Well, thank you so much, David. That was such a fascinating talk. And you know, I am a historian. So if I say it's a fascinating talk, really, I, I really got a lot out of it. Um, and so I can't wait to hear what all of the proper cognitive science and mathematician and philosophers have to say. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll start with the questions that are in the chat. And then I'm gonna encourage you if you have a question uh, to raise your hands and I'm gonna simply go in order of, of the folks as they appear on my list. So to begin, Linda Cochran was wondering, um, she says that Japanese has more than one numbering system. What effect might that have? Yeah, um, so that's interesting. Um, we did consider this. So when we ran our study, we uh, began by exploring which system children seem to be more familiar with. Um, but uh, Korean is also like this. So there are multiple counting systems and there are other languages that have different counting systems for counting different kinds of things. Um, so I recall that Mathieu Lecor back in the days had an unpublished data set. And what he did is he tested Korean kids on their two counting systems and asked whether their knowledge of these two systems was related, but I don't remember what he found, <laughs> um, but they were different. And my suspicion is that they kind of look like, you know, how our bilingual kids look, which is that you would expect there to be transfer in the, in the counting algorithms, um, but uh, not transfer for the small number words, because those depend on a different type of, um, just a totally different learning process. Um, but to my knowledge, there haven't been any published reports of how these systems interact. Uh, so bilinguals is, is kind of the closest we can come right now. Uh, Parisa had a question that was actually similar to mine, so I'll ask it next. Uh, so this is in reference to Lorenzo. Is it possible that the concept of counting already exists in the child's brain, but hasn't yet been matched with the concept of language, i.e. arbitrary words or numbers, or the action of counting at this young age? And the example she gives is, if you presented a child with two piles of cookies, one pile has three and the other has five, is it very likely that he chooses the bigger pile with the higher number? And what do you think such a behavior signifies? Yeah, uh, that's a really great question. I mean, it's sort of, in a way, this is the problem of this literature is where do these concepts come from, right? So if you don't have them when you start, how can you, how can you build them? Do they come out of the ether? Um, you know, how do you use input if you don't have some kind of hypothesis space for reasoning about the input? Um, the answer, so the answer to this is tricky, right? Um, in a way, we don't know, um, but I can tell you a couple of things. One is that we know that pretty much every animal species, if you give them two piles, they can discriminate those two piles on the basis of their ratio. Um, so there's a, a, the Weber fraction. So if uh, it's a, they stand in a two to one ratio, even um, you know, newborn infants can discriminate those quantities. Um, and you see this in fish and you know, um, insects of various types. And it's just everywhere um, in, in cognition, probably because of the architecture of the nervous system. Um, but is that counting is the question, right? And so I, I've really, you know, I've taken the position, some people think that essentially it is, right? That, that counting gets its content from mapping words, um, taking words and kind of gluing them onto that set of magnitudes. But the problem with, the, with that story is that counting discriminates 113 from 112, uh, just as well as it discriminates one from two. And that's not true of our human perceptual capacity or what fish do. Um, and we know that there are lots of cultures that don't have counting systems and that as a, as a result of that can't do all kinds of computations that counting affords us. Um, they do have other numerical intuitions though. And so the question is, do they have the types of intuitions that might allow you to, you know, that there may be kind of the, the components that go into counting. Um, one example of that is one-to-one -one correspondence or Hume's principle. So if I show you two sets, or if I show you a set of things, can you take another set of things and line them up in one-to-one -one correspondence to get the same number? So there's work, uh, as uh, some of you probably know in the Piraha, 
which is an Amazonian enumerate group that shows um, there's a couple studies that show they can't do this. One that shows that they maybe can. Um, but my reading on that literature is that the, the weight of the evidence suggests that they, they can't do this. And the reason I conclude this is because we have data, Rose Schneider in my lab has really compelling data from uh, children that shows that they really, really can't do this. So they can match up to three things, but they cannot match six or seven or eight until af well after they learn how to count actually. So they can count, they know what you're asking, um, but if they're not allowed to count, they can't do this matching task. Like these are separate, separate abilities. Um, I, could, yeah, I could go on. I mean, there's lots to say there. It's a really interesting question. Um, I'm going to move on and then I'm going to go to the list of hands and I'm going to encourage the folks in chat to just raise your hand at this point. So Catherine Hewish asks, uh, do the tests for knowing involve only the child giving objects or only giving the child objects likely? Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's okay. So the answer is the, all the data that I showed you today, um, that's true. So the given number task involves the child having to act. So in a way it's kind of a hard task. And if you go back in time in the seventies and eighties, Rochelle Gelman early on was arguing that counting is innate actually, that the counting principles are innate and that really kids just have to kind of, you know, figure out how their behaviors conform to those innate principles. Um, and she thought that the given number task was just too difficult because it requires the child to coordinate all kinds of activities. And that's true. But it turns out that if you show kids um, pictures on a screen and ask them how many things there are, you find that these two tasks are really well correlated with each other. Um, and so that's been shown a couple of times in the literature, um, but we have data like that as well. I mean, it's basically not distinguishable. There are small differences. Um, so, you know, the other thing is that these tasks are pretty reliable. So we've just done a study of the reliability of the given number task. So if you test a kid uh, once and then again in the same session, the, the assessment is um, very likely to generate the same outcome for most numbers for one and two and for being a, a full counter, it's quite reliable. For the higher knower levels, it's a bit lower, like three and four, it's a bit uh, fuzzier. But yeah, that, I mean, that's a, it's always a concern. You want multiple uh, sources of evidence to confirm and, and it's there, but you know, it's, it's tricky. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm gonna move on to Ulf and then we'll get to Alexis and Mitcha before going back to the speakers list. So Ulf, please ask your question. Yeah, uh, thanks. Thank you so much for the talk. This was really great. Um, I have a question, but so it seems if I understood you correctly that um, the the counting and so the idea of numbers and counting numbers and the idea of um, the things counted come apart so that the, you know you get get the counting and then the, the objects counted come apart. but it, then again when you think about it again it seems that that can't really be what's going on because it's it seems that when they get the the counting of objects right then they for example think that there are infinitely many numbers but that then suggests to me that they think that the that the numerals and the counting there is really correlated with what is counted because otherwise it would seem for example i mean you can systematically um label the points on the globe but they're finitely many i, I mean they are dense and in that sense they're infinitely many but just the, the fact that you can recursively name something doesn't mean that there are infinitely many of them and um, so it seems that they they jump to that the conclusion the kids yes. um so, and, and that then suggests to me that they somehow still run this together. And I'm wondering, do they or don't they? And when, when do they fully get the difference as it were between the, the numeral and the number itself? Uh -huh. uh, I see, I see. Uh, yeah, I agree that this isn't a justified inference. So that's you know, something that Lance Rips has talked about a lot that you could, you could derive all kinds of inferences from this finite experience. And it's just so happens that children uh, derive what seems to be the right one, which is that numbers continue. And that's an inference about numbers, not just about numerals, right? Um, which is interesting too. Um, I mean, full counters. So they know uh, when they're three and a half that counting aligns somehow to objects, but what they don't get is the, the, the general principle, right? That as you count up one, you add one. So they know that there's some kind of game that they're playing that relates the count list or the numerals to sets, but they just don't know what 
the, they don't understand what the rules of that game are. They know how to play it sort of, right? Like they can imitate this procedure, um, but they don't understand that for any number that's true. And that in general, there's this relation of counting up and adding one. It's sometimes called a structure mapping or an analogical mapping. So that seems to be what they're missing. Um, and early on, people used to think that actually it was by virtue of making that mapping. So like Susan Carey or Dedra Gentner argued this, that they notice it for one, two, and three, that as you add one, you count up one. And then they just generalize that. And that's what makes them a full counter. Well, that, that turns out not to be true. They don't get that inference until they're about five and a half or six. And I think that's the point at which they're really getting that recursive rule that links the numerals to the sets. And then they're, you're right, they're making an inference from the symbolic system to the system of content. They're, they're making an inference from how the syntax works to properties of number, which are diff a different type of object. And I just, wanna, I just wanna add that actually at the same age, kids uh, begin to think that space and time are infinite as well. And so we have some data on that. Um, and I, I won't go into that too much here, but it seems um, possible that these intuitions are related, that this, in, this kind of move from the formal to um, inferences about the world might be more general. Fascinating, thanks. Great, so I'm gonna give Alexis a, a chance to ask her question. Sure, um, thanks so much, David, for the talk. Um, you discussed the importance of two things in the acquisition of productive systematic number knowledge, uh, representations in the small number system and systematicity in the linguistic representation of higher numbers. And so I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the role, if any, of non-linguistic approximate number representations in mathematical cognition. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I mean, it seems like a very popular view that uh, the approximate number system is foundational um, in human numeracy. And if you look at reasoning about number, um, so if you look at, for example, um, my ability to judge whether uh, 15 like is greater than 10, those types of systems are engaged. So there's no doubt that reasoning about number implicates these evolutionarily ancient perceptual abilities like the approximate number system. And that's incontrovertible, right? But the question is whether formal capa the capacity to acquire a formal system depends on that. So whether the, you know, the integer system depends on that same capacity. And I don't know of any evidence for that. Um, and so in a recent uh, art, uh, paper in TICS, uh, Trends in Cognitive Science, um, Susan Carey and I reviewed the literature and argued that kids don't begin uh, stitching together that approximate number system and the symbolic system until after they figured out how counting works. That being said, um, I, I, I suspect that there's, you know, it's just inevitable. These things are, are all getting related to each other early on. So they're hearing number of words, they're counting, they're noticing that there are magnitudes in the world. So surely they play a role in reasoning relatively early in life. But what I'm talking about is a logical capacity and there's just nothing logical about the approximate number system. It's really a magnitude system. Um, it doesn't have anything like a successor rule or any kind of logic contained within it. Um, it allows you to discriminate magnitudes. Um, and so I think mathematicians, you know, they, they don't want you know, numbers to be about magnitudes, right? This is one usage, it's one use case, um, but numbers ultimately are much more abstract than that. So that's, that's my take on it. Um, if there, you know, it would, be, it would be interesting if there were evidence to the contrary, maybe the approximate number system is used to learn one, two, and three. I think that's the most likely case right, uh, uh, scenario right now that it, because that system is precise up to one, two, three. So it could be used to learn those associative meanings, but then there's something else going on with counting that looks procedural initially and then logical. Very interesting, thank you so much. Uh, great, we'll move to Mitra Hartman. Thanks for a really fun talk. Um, it was really great. Um, I was curious whether there's a reason uh, for thinking that this learning is re recursive rather than iterative. Well, um, it's definitely iterative. Uh, and so the question is how we can tell recursive representations from iterative ones. Um, now, I, I don't know if you have something 
um, in mind. Uh, but I, I mean, it's true. Okay, so here's something interesting. It's true that when you get to 109, um, <laughs> no matter what language you're studying, so this is true in Cantonese and it's true in English, a lot of kids don't know what comes after 109. Um, and so they don't, so actually they don't seem to understand what 100 is. Um, so if you tell, so it, it, what I think is going on is that they think 100 and uh, 110, whatever the label for that is, are just um, analogous decade transitions. As though they don't know that when you get to 10 decades, there's a transition to the hundreds, right? And so it's true that um, a lot of kids who are five and a half don't understand the, the, you know, the embedding of the tens under the hundreds and that the hundreds embed under thousands. And that's just really difficult. Even adults have difficulty <laughs> with this when you get to sufficiently large numbers. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess there's still, there's still space there to wriggle um, and you know, to dispute what, what type of generalization kids have made. Um, one of the things that makes me think that it probably has a recursive, um, uh, that, that, that it probably does have the full power of a recursive function is just that they're drawing on uh, a morphological generalization to extract the rule. Um, and uh, this, this is one thing that natural language is good at is providing recursive representations. Um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks. Um, so we'll move on to Michelle Hurst. Hi, Dave. Thanks so much. That was a really interesting talk. Um, a comment that actually nine-year-old Anouk made uh, about infinity made me think about this question where before she got to the explanation about successor function and integers, she mentioned uh, decimals and fractions. And so I'm wondering what you think about um, the relationship in children's understanding between ideas about, you know, integer-based successor function infinity and denseness, rational number, um, ideas about, about infiniteness and density. Yeah, I kind of wasn't expecting her to mention those properties, um, to be yeah. honest. Um, and, you know, some people have argued uh, that actually kids could figure out that numbers are infinite in all kinds of different ways. So the successor function is one way, but you might, you know, as Anouk noted, you might just um, notice that you can just add digits to uh, an irrational number infinitely as well. Um, or you can multiply by 10, uh, or, you know, there's all kinds of functions that you can apply. Um, there is very little um, on this question, but there is a, at least one study um, by Susan Carey and Greg Solomon that looked at infinite divisibility, mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just it's it's a, it's a harder case because you know that what they did is they asked kids about like for example styrofoam and whether you can divide it up uh, infinitely, and kids say I think what I would say, which is no, you can't, because <laughs> there's a certain point at which it's no longer styrofoam or just becomes too difficult to separate. Um, but you know actually there is an age I think it's around maybe eight, seven or eight that kids begin to argue that you can infinitely divide. So it looks later than what's going on with this uh, successor function. Um, yeah, but I would love to kind of dig deeper into that to you know, explore that more. Um, people have looked at other kind of games. That, so there's, there are these papers by Falk um, where they play these uh, number games like, okay, here's the game. Um, whoever guesses the largest number wins. Do you wanna go first or second? And so like, obviously you should always go second in that game. Um, and so, you know, they reason that this is the way to test whether kids know that you, there's like no largest number. That seems a bit, you know, metacognitive, but um, there's, yeah, that's another approach that's been taken. Cool, thanks. Um, and now we'll go to Dirk, sorry, Dirk Schlimm. Hi, thanks, thanks for your talk. I wonder, what do you think about the difference between number words, like in languages, which we were talking about, and numeral systems that are symbolic, right? Because, I mean, for uh, natural languages, I think 
there exists a highest number word. Right? I think Greenberg <laughs> has generalized this. So in fact, uh, the generalization of the successor functions that uh, the children do is actually wrong for the language that they're using. Yeah. Right? yeah. But it is true for you know, the decimal place value system. Um, and then also I think for when it comes to more advanced mathematics, like addition or something like that, I think that's much more difficult doing in, in natural language than doing in symbolic systems. So I wonder what, what your views are about the, the different roles that they play. Yeah, I mean, one way of thinking about this is that the transition that you see in kids between the ages of five and six is a transition in which system they're thinking about. Um, so this is, I, I don't know how to get at this yet, right? But one, one possibility is that when you ask a five-year-old, do numbers ever end? They're actually answering correctly um, by saying, yes, they do. Um, but then when you ask a six-year-old, do numbers ever end? And they say, no, they don't. They're actually answering a totally different question um, because they're reasoning about numbers, not about numerals. Um, so you know, it's a homophone in, in English, right? Um, but if, even if that's true, it tells us that, you know, six-year-olds are thinking about formal objects and five-year-olds aren't, uh, but how, you know, how do we get it? If that's true, um, the puzzle is how do we ask a five-year-old whether, uh, whether numbers are infinite, if they equate numbers with, with numerals, I, I'm not sure. But you're totally right that not, you know number words definitely do end. I mean, we could sit and create new ones if we wanted to, but they'd still always be finite. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, finally, you've got Linda Cochran. You've written your number your your question in chat, but maybe just just reiterate it for us. <clears throat> no, thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, I, it, I think you've actually already answered the question, but I'll reword it, which is about supertizing. That humans are not very good at supertizing. We seem to be limited to about three, and that's it. Whereas a lot of other species can supertize much larger numbers. Even dogs <laughs> can supertize much larger numbers. But I think you sort of talked about it before. You just weren't using the term supertize. Yeah. Right. So I think you sort of answered the question anyway. I see. Yeah, right. So supertization was, you know, Mandler and Shibo used this term in the 80s. Um, and it sometimes gets used to describe all estimation. So if I show you 75 dots, you might say, oh, there's 60. And, and so that would be kind of uh, one meaning of supertization, which is just estimation. And then some people reserve it for small numbers like one, two, three, or numbers that you can accurately uh, estimate. Um, and yeah, I tried to, I tried not to wade too much into the waters of nonverbal numerical cognition in this talk, because it's a, it's a vast space. Um, but that's, yeah, that's right. Great. So we'll go on to Simone uh, Brujapaglia. Hi, uh, thank you very much for, for the great talk. So uh, I'm not a cognitive scientist. I am a mathematician, so I just have a curiosity. Um, do you, so is there any research about, because you've been uh, talking about when uh, children can learn to generalize from like counting to maybe understanding infinity, is there any research about what's going on in the brain that allows this generalization? And then maybe uh, going back to Ada Lovelace, do you think that this kind of generalization could happen in a machine, like from counting to getting mathematical insights? So that's kind of more of a philosophical question for you. Maybe. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know where this comes from, but I do. So one thing that I lean on in this talk, you know, and this is just maybe my bias as somebody who has a bit of linguistics training, is that we know that children from a very young age are inclined to impose rules onto finite data structures um, that, you know, in their finiteness don't justify rules, right? So rule, so there's a kind of um, a disposition to create rules to describe data sets. And those just, those just freely generate, right? So natural language is an example of this where we take a finite set of words, compose them to generate a potentially infinite set of thoughts and, and sentences. So that's why in, in my, my intuition is that 
Um, this is why counting systems have the structure that they do. They really look like you know, systems that are generated by natural language. Um, they look like morphological paradigms. Um, and if that's right, then it would just, it would be normal that they would um, show these same generative capacities. So if you look, you know, even at the simplest rules in natural language, like the past tense, kids learn it over a finite set of data, and then they extend it to new exemplars, right? The past tense or the plural um, or other, you know, other types of morphological paradigms. And so that's one way of thinking about what's going on here is they hear one through nine, they hear the decades, 20, 30, 40, and they think, okay, I've got it. That this is, this is a rule that applies all the way up. Um, and, you know, to the point where they get it wrong when they get to a hundred, right? So that's my intuition. Um, but, you know, you might think that natural language draws on that generative capacity, but it's kind of more general, you know, so you might think that um, it's not that it comes from language, but that language depends on a generative capacity that's maybe inherent in, in human thought. Um, and, you know, that's, that's certainly possible. What we see in the abacus, for example, isn't, isn't quite the same beast, but there are, there is the potential to create symbolic systems in a nonverbal format in humans. So we're perfectly good at creating uh, symbols in a visual format as well, uh, like maps, for example, or numerals, right? So that's, that's kind of a remarkable property of humans. And maybe that depends on language um, or maybe language depends on something that's more general. Great, and finally, uh, Diane Poulain Dubois. Hello, David. Bonjour. Thank you so much for your bonsoir. Thank you, bonjour for you, bonsoir for mm -hmm. us. Uh, thank you so much for your talk, so stimulating. I want to push you outside your zone of comfort. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> the linguistic transparency that you discuss for um, num uh, numeracy, can you um, tell us a little bit more about its impact outside uh, the domain that you discussed tonight for the benefit of this audience? Sure. Um, yeah, right. So Miller and so there's this older paper by Miller and Stigler um, who are interested in the transparency of counting systems. And what they argued is that because Chinese has this transparent counting system, it might allow them to learn the counting rules earlier. And since counting is foundational to arithmetic, it might then confer benefits on later mathematics education. I'm not sure if that's what you had in mind. So there, there are these kind of early claims that the reason why Chinese kids excel earlier in mathematics than kids in the US is because of the nature of the counting system. Um, and there, there are a couple of other papers kind of along these lines. Um, the, one issue with this is that there are lots of reasons to think that Chinese kids might um, excel at uh, arithmetic relative to US kids. And so it's really, really hard to isolate that property um, um, because they just get all kinds of, um, you know, the amount of training they, uh, that the kids in these studies get is just massively greater once they hit the school age. Um, in our study, once you control for um, other variables, we don't see big differences between Chinese kids and US kids actually. Um, so if you control for how high their initial count is, the amount of training they, they get. So if you use that as a proxy, the US kids and Chinese kids look pretty similar. But if you go to China, and China is a big country, right? So if you go to different parts, like regions of China, you're gonna find just all kinds of variability from different regions based on you know, economic conditions and the amount of training they get, whether they're urban or rural. So I feel like it's just such a difficult uh, cross-cultural question to answer definitively and that it's much easier, I think, to look within a country. So like the, you know, if you look within India, for example, and compare the kids who are learning Hindi and the kids who are learning English, um, that's, I think, going to be an interesting type of comparison because you can more or less control for the um, academic setting. Mm -hmm. um, it is still confounded with income, unfortunately, but I think that's kind of, we haven't done that yet, but that would be a really interesting space to explore. But even in social cognition, the linguistic transparency is, is obvious. For example, in theory of mind, children who learn a language like Turkish that has a marker that indicates who told uh, you about uh, something, 
So I they, they learn false belief earlier than children who speak English or French. Gosh. Because, yeah, I was told by XYZ that it's going to rain tomorrow versus I saw, I know, I, I, I read directly that it's going to rain or I witness an event myself. And I... they show a benefit in social cognition. Okay. Okay. No, no, no. Okay. That's, that's great. That's great. I, I totally missed your question. I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Linda Cochrane has another one here. India has a long history of excellence in mathematics. Do they concentrate on symbols rather than language? Oh my goodness. It's so intense. Right. Um, so the first set of studies that I showed you are from India and I wish I could, I could, I wish I could show you a slideshow of my experiences in India at math competitions because it's just so culturally different. I mean, we ha they fill stadiums with kids at math competitions there. Um, we attended two years ago, I attended a, world, a Guinness Book of World Records attempt to create the largest human abacus, uh, which failed. <laughs> <laughs> in kind of horrific, a horrific way that I'll tell you about another time if you like. Um, but it was very, <laughs> it was quite a catastrophe. Um, but anyway, uh, you know, they, they literally fill stadiums with kids at math competition. So it's very different math culture. Um, and do they focus on language? I mean, no, I, I, I don't think so, right? Like, like nobody really thinks about language as math training um, in, in any culture that I know of. Do they, do they train their kids how to count? Not really. Um, so when we look at kids who are preschoolers, they're not especially good counters um, relative to US kids. But once they hit school, once they, once they begin receiving formal education, um, they receive kind of a very old school, traditional drill oriented mathematics training. Um, and you know, it, it works pretty well. Um, <laughs> so there, there are different paths to excellence. I, I mean, it, I, think, I think it's an interesting question whether that approach, um, you know, creates, there's a, there's a debate in the math ed uh, literature as to whether we should be teaching conceptual content or procedures or both. And most people think it's both. Um, what I've argued today is that if you, if you give children intensive practice in procedures, kids are smart and they'll make all kinds of inferences beyond the training that you give them. And so I'm not totally sure that training kids on concepts before procedures is actually the right way to go um, because they may not have the right infrastructure for making sense of the conceptual content if they don't say, for example, if you try to teach them the logic of counting before they know how to count, uh, my money is that that's going to be not very successful. Uh, but yeah, anyway, in, in India, um, you know, they, it's, you know, there's just, it's, it's hard to tease these things apart, but it doesn't look like parents are especially involved in preschool math training. But once they hit school age, there's a lot of extracurricular stuff going on and it's very intense in the school system as well. Uh, yeah, thank you, but, but I was actually trying, I worded my question badly. <laughs> I uh, was actually talking about the fact that the numbering system is so difficult, and you remarked on the um, students not being, in, Indians not being able to count very well, having to do it in English, because it was easier. Um, so are they using symbols rather than... Oh, yeah. Them? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's one thing that, that we've discovered in India is when um, lots of kids, when they learn how to count, um, I don't know if anyone learned how to count in India here, but they, uh, lots of the kids count like this. They say 10, one, zero, 11, one, one, uh, 12, one, two. So they actually um, repeat the digits afterwards to make the irregularities transparent. Um, and I've never seen that anywhere else. And I, I felt like stopping them because, <laughs> you know, to count, when we ask kids to count as high as they can, it doubles the amount of time to do that assessment. <laughs> it's kind of painful, but. Sorry, David, I accidentally muted you. Are you back? Yep, no problem. I was done. <laughs> I didn't mean to do that. Um, I think that, I think this is a great place to end. Thank you so much for being with us today. It's just been an absolute pleasure and I thank you all for joining us.
Thank you so much too. It's good to see everyone and all the familiar faces. Thanks, um, thanks for the question. Yeah. <laughs> right. Thank you. Excellent. So is there a wine and cheese, Charles? <laughs> I have my uh, nice non-alcoholic beer, so. <laughs> Needed. Absolutely. So I'm a historian of India, so I found this even more exciting as a, as a non-math person than I, than I might have. Um, oh, cool. And the mother of six-year-old twin boys who are super into counting and math in addition so you've blown my mind this has been just absolutely amazing uh, that's oh cool you have to well i mean they're a bit old but you should ask them about this stuff like with with a nook when she was nine when i asked her so they may know that numbers are infinite but they they may have difficulty justifying it so i'd be curious to ask your kids at six you know do numbers keep on going and then like why do they keep on going how do you know that Right. I will. Yeah. I don't think, they, I don't think they can answer me conceptually, but they did. My, my, my wife's been teaching them lots of different kinds of math this, well this summer and during the pandemic. And so yeah. they got the idea of like, um, like exponential, exponential multiplication, like to the power of. So I think they have the idea that like numbers are infinite and they're able to connect numbers to space weirdly because of like science shows they've watched, but yeah, it's, it's still, there's, it's still really murky, but yeah, I just so much of what you said really resonated with me. So I just I just loved it. I'm so glad that you joined us today. Um, so a, a few years ago, I guess it would be about five or six years ago now. Um, the physics department was interviewing. So we we're trying to do a partner hire. There's this guy interviewing in physics, and he stayed at my house. And uh, he so he asked my daughter about whether space is infinite. And so she was around this age, five, five and a half. And, and she's like, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Space just goes on and on and on forever. And, and then he said, oh, okay. Do you know anything else that's like that? And she's like, yeah, numbers, numbers are infinite too. And, and so then I, that was the moment where I was like, oh, you know, maybe, just maybe these two things are related to each other. Like maybe the I idea that space goes on. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so we have data on children's intuitions about space and time, but it's just not, it's, we're not done with it yet. So, but I feel like that's another thing I would ask your kids. Yeah. Is, do they think that space, because nobody, I mean, there's no intuitions to draw on, right? Like, what do you, how do you, unless someone tells you that space is infinite, what do you lean on? Like the notion of infinity, they they grappled with that from like four and a half, no, probably five and a half to like deep yeah. into six. Just is this infinity? What's the number after infinity? Like that was a question a lot. So just <laughs> the, the notion of the infinite was really huge for them. But also I've spent a lot of time in India and I've been to a math competition in a huge stadium in Delhi. So <laughs> Awesome. I'm very excited to go check out the YouTube footage of this abacus building that you're talking about. It's so, it, yeah. Go ahead. Also, everybody should feel free to like unmute and Actually, chat. I have, I have a question on this topic for, for Leah, because isn't it true that, you know, 150 years ago or even less that there were some mathematicians who objected to talk of infinite sets and things like that? <clears throat> so it's kind of interesting if kids have this intuitive idea that numbers go on forever. You know, is it, is, am I misremembering? I thought I'd read about that there were you know, actually arguments about whether you should talk about infinity and infinite sets. Yeah. I, I'm trying to ask Leia a question. I don't know the history of mathematics, so I have nothing to say about that no. debate. I mean, I know. I was asking Leia, matter. not you, actually. Oh, I yeah, good, good. Um, Thank goodness. I think it, I'm guessing it's probably the time where they were, they were trying to figure out, sort out set theory and the time where they were, you know, the yeah. issue of cardinality and what's, you know, what's one kind of infinity versus another kind of infinity. And this is maybe when they were discussing that, you know, you shouldn't use the word infinity because, you know, we have alpha naught and alpha, you have different kinds of infinities and you shouldn't kind of jumble them all together. 
Um, so I'm guessing that's when it happens, but I, I don't really know exactly. Okay. <laughs> Great. David, uh, can I can I talk? Yeah. Binda's gone, but I have something to say about Japanese counting system. That two system. One is, I think, one is definitely unproductive. It's just a memorization because we we don't use anything more than 10 for that counting system. I don't really know mm -hmm. what to say 11 in that counting system. It's mm -hmm. just up to 10. Mm -hmm. And I grew up with my grandparents. They never <laughs> said anything above 10 with that counting system. And as, as soon as it hits 11, then we go to that similar um, yeah, that's, that was that Mandarin, that very transparent, mm -hmm. like, yeah, 10, 1, 10, 2, then 2, 10, 1, 2, 10, 2, that kind of system. Mm. So it's up to 10. It's not hard to memorize. And I think that's about it. Okay. I don't know about Korean. Yeah, no, I don't know either. I should, I should. I should look into whether Korean go. I, I bet you it doesn't, because my understanding is that these are used in different contexts as well. Like that yeah. the bounded system is conversational and the other is really for counting and calculation. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that you see this, like um, if you go, if you look at Mayan languages or kind of, you know, uh, colonial settings, you see also hybrid lang hybrid counting systems where small numbers are in some indigenous language and then Spanish will be grafted on in different ways, right? They're yeah. kind of competing with each other. And so there's probably, I mean, it's probably something analogous going on where there really isn't the need to have two fully productive counting systems. Yeah. Um, um, oh, that's, yeah, thank you. And someone also said iterative versus recursive. I clearly remember when like some sometime I was in elementary school, I I don't know which one is iterative and which one is recursive. When I when so the Japanese system of counting hits ten thousand, then ten thousand has a unit like different from 10 and 100 and 1,000. And 10,000 has its own its own name. Then 10,000 goes, then it, it becomes transparent. So 10,000 has, it's called man, then 10 man, then 100 man, 1,000 man. Then it goes to another unit. And I remember that I was doing really wrong in counting that one unit over 10,000. So that's going to be, there's eight zeros. So in English, what is that? Wait, so your, so your point is that this 100. is, uh, so is your point that this bears on the iterative versus recursive? Point? Yeah, then, then, then what I, as a kid, hypothesized is that this new unit, which is hun, no one, that's one million. So what? 10 million. 10 million. Yeah, that unit, when it goes up, then I have to use the unit, one unit before that. Uh, it's it's more like, <laughs> it is hard to explain. It's, if I can write it down. Better do this on paper, be, Hisako. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I will, I will just email you yeah. in, the, in writing, because that yeah. was, that sounds like a good plan. It's, we've just hit it's, 8 o'clock, and so I'm going yeah. to ask everyone to, to stay. Yeah, it's 8 o'clock. Thank right. you. Right. Thank Thanks, Isako. Thanks, Leah.
Uh, yeah, thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, David. It was really okay. interesting. Talk. Yes, it was a great talk. I'll be in touch. Yeah, with thanks again, Charles. Okay. Okay. Bye -bye. I'm going to end the meeting. Charles. Yeah. Thanks okay. for organizing. Yeah, and thank you. Thanks to everybody. Okay, who's that there? I can't see your name. Another kid. You like kids. Oh, I went to post. <laughs> there's the, I, I, Leah has it, and uh, for Rachel and I, oh, and Monica, there's a, uh, children's story version of about Ada Lovelace and the author talking through it. I'll post, I'll, I'll send it out to you so you can, uh, Leia, Leia watched it, I think, right? And, yeah, it was very nice. Yeah. Nice pictures. Yeah, so I'll, uh, I'll, I'll post that somewhere. So, okay. I think it too. It's, it's like a little board book, right? Uh, like the there might be more than one. There, there are many different okay. ones. Yeah. We have this one. This one's really nice. Yeah. <laughs> Ours is basic. Good. All right. So unfortunately, our dean uh, couldn't make it. So Patrick was supposed to, Patrick Leroux, but he had a last minute uh, child care issue. So he wasn't able to make it either. But, uh, you know, if you get a chance, we can, maybe I'll write up a little report for him or something like that. And maybe we could all send it to him, you know, sign it or something together just to. And Tyra said he was from Antarctica. Yeah, so Tyler. can make it. Yeah. yeah. So uh, Leah, do you know Tyler Margitis? He was in, he, he studied math and math education. So uh, Nadia and Anna, I don't know if Anna Serpinska made it, but uh, they know Tyler. So Tyler did math and math education and then he did a cog sci course with me and then he went to San Diego and now he's a professor at uh, University of California in Merced. So he was, he, he, he said he was in Antarctica and uh, we had a, a bunch of, uh, former students here. So it was very nice to see everybody. So, all right, so it's getting late and- uh, Charles, I'm gonna ask you to stay on because I wanna talk to you quickly about our meeting tomorrow. Okay, it. Rachel and I are gonna stay on. So everybody, please, okay. please leave okay. so we don't have to throw you out. Bye, thank you.